Good afternoon. I am going to encourage all of those of you in the back of the room, if you want to come up and take a chair further towards the front, this is a long room. Don't hesitate to move forward here while I make a few introductory comments. I'm delighted to um, welcome all of you here today. I'm Rebecca Blank. I'm Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. The Ford School and the National Poverty Center, which resides in the Ford School, are today together co-sponsoring the discussion of one of the most important issues of the day, social security reform. Recently, someone asked me if I thought that the Gulf Coast hurricanes had pushed social security reform off the table, and my reply was absolutely not, though they may have delayed it a little. While the subject may have temporarily receded from center stage, the social security debate is not going away. Social security affects the health and the welfare of large numbers of Americans. The financial challenges to this program, particularly in the face of an aging baby boom, will need to be solved. We're fortunate to have with us today four people who are absolute experts on this topic and who can discuss the issues raised in the debate over how we should proceed with reform. I know each of them personally, and I can assure you this is going to be an interesting and a very valuable discussion. I also know there's a little bit of disagreement among this group about what the appropriate next steps on Social Security reform should be, and I hope that we can have a good discussion about those different viewpoints. Um, before I get into the introduction of our keynote speaker, let me just tell you a little bit about the panelists who are going to follow. Our panel discussion, I'm assuming, is going to start around 3.25 or so. We're going to have a keynote speech, take a very short break, and then come back together again for the panel. Um, so I want to give you just a little information about today's panelists to whet your appetite to stay for that part of the program. Let me start with Dr. Henry Aaron. Um, Henry, stand up so they know you're here. Um, is a senior fellow and the Bruce and Virginia McClory um, Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institute. He's also Chair of the Board of Directors of the National Academy of Social Insurance. He has long been active in writing about and working on the politics of Social Security reform, not just during this last round of reform, but through a number of rounds of reform in the past. Thank you for coming to Ann Arbor today, Hank, and I know that one of the reasons for your presence here today is your professional affiliation and long friendship with Ned, and we're, we're delighted to have you. Professor Olivia Mitchell, is the director, and Olivia stand up too, is the director of the Bettner Center for Pension and Retirement Research at the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania, where she is a professor of insurance and risk management and business and public policy. As a member of President Bush's Commission for Strengthening Social Security, Olivia's had an opportunity to lend her expertise to those who are leading the privatization debate on the bill. And Professor Bob Willis is here in the corner, is here at the University of Michigan, where he's professor of economics. Most importantly for our panel today, Bob directs the Health and Retirement Study, the primary survey available on retirement behavior and well-being within the older population, and also directs the study of asset and health dynamics among the oldest old, known as AHEAD. Chairing our panel is Darren Lobotsky. Darren is a visiting professor in economics from the University of Illinois. And I want to make sure you know sort of how great the expertise is in that panel, so you'll all be here when we start that off after our keynote address. I'm now honored to introduce to you our keynote speaker, Dr. Edward Gramlich. Ned Gramlich is a long-term professor of economics and public policy at the University of Michigan. He chaired the Quadrennial Advisory Council on Social Security in the mid-1990s and took leave from the University of Michigan soon afterwards to serve from 1997 to 2005 as a member of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. Ned returned to the university just this past month as the Richard A. Musgrave Professor at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. We were um, planning at one point that he was going to be teaching in the Ford School, but the university needed him for more important things, and he's currently serving as the interim provost. We planned this symposium not just as an important vehicle to continue the public discussion that surrounds Social Security reform, but as a way to celebrate Ned's return to the University of Michigan and to the Ford School. I'm very happy to welcome Ned back to the university. As many of you know, Ned was the founding dean of the Ford School, and I've deeply valued the foundations that he built through his leadership at the school. I've always considered a, re a real honor to follow Ned Gramlich at the Ford School. It's just great to have him back on campus, and I very much hope he'll be back at the Ford School next fall as a teacher and a colleague, given he um, wasn't there this fall. Um, I'm delighted to ask Ned at this point to come to the podium and to deliver his keynote address, One More Look at Social Security.
Thank you very much, Becky. It's great to be back. And I must say, uh, Becky has done so much with the school that I left her that I'm glad I preceded her and didn't have to follow her. She would be a very tough act to follow, and I'm glad I didn't have to. Uh, Social Security was an uh, earlier part of my life. I, uh, I, I got heavily into it um, about 10 years ago. I was chair of the, uh, at the time, called the Advisory Council on Social Security Reform in the Clinton administration. We came out with a report. Uh, we were fractured. Uh, we had uh, a right-wing report, a, a left-wing report, and a, a sensible middle ground uh, report. <laughs> Uh, and that was mine. My, that was basically my plan. I got all of two out of 13 votes for, for my plan. But I'm still, I'm still on the stump a little bit, though. Today, I'm going to uh, try to broaden the appeal and not talk about a particular plan, but just a, a general approach. Yeah. Let, let me start with uh, some, some good news. We're, we're going to talk a lot today about uh, what is going to look like a very, very difficult problem, indeed is a very, very difficult problem, of uh, providing the uh, financing of Social Security reform in the uh, coming century. Um, but, and, and one can get very discouraged in going through that. A lot of us have been doing that for years and years. But uh, it's, uh, I think, helpful to step back and recognize that the reason that, uh, or one reason that uh, the financial problems look, uh, for Social Security look so serious is actually some good news. And there are two pieces of good news. One is that uh, uh, both in the United States and around the world, birth rates have dropped pretty sharply and are now uh, in, uh, in the United States, they're, they're roughly at the level that would uh, equalize their, uh, uh, ma maintain a constant population over time. In many other countries, they're actually well below that. And the consequence is that uh, it, uh, when, when many of us up here today were much younger, you, you were looking at uh, indefinitely rising popul world population. Now we're, we're really looking at a stable world population, just a little bit above its uh, present levels. And that's probably a good thing, given the uh, world stock of resources. The second point, obviously, is that people are living longer, and uh, it, it doesn't take a whole lot of imagination to uh, uh, think about the alternative to that. And so there, are, there is some good news, but the, uh, that, that leads to uh, an implication, which is that as a result of these trends in birth rates and death rates, that uh, populations are aging, uh, they, they are moving to a level with a much higher share of um, old people in, in retirement years. And uh, implicit in that is uh, high entitlement spending burdens. So how, how bad is it? Uh, and I, I've taken these charts from the recent report of the Social Security and Medicare trustees. The, uh, if you can squint and see this, the oh, uh, previous one, please. Uh, no, the the chart. There we are. So the the blue line is uh, what uh, Social Security calls the income rate. That's really the tax rate. This is all as a percent of payroll. The, the top red and blue pair are for Social Security. Uh, that's uh, OASDI, that's uh, Old Age Survivors and Disability Insurance Program. The, uh, the blue line is set at, uh, it, it's slightly above 12.4% of payroll. And the red line is uh, the, the cost of the benefits that are implicit in uh, forecasts that we make uh, for the future of Social Security. And you can see that right now, uh, where the horizontal line is there, uh, 2005, 
uh, the, the blue line's ahead of the red line, that is the uh, Social Security Trust Fund actually has a slight surplus. But because of the birth and death uh, uh, trends that I mentioned, um, we're, we're looking at a, uh, a quick change in that. Pretty soon, uh, Social Security is going to um, be running large uh, cash deficits. Uh, the bottom pair, uh, I want to bring in uh, health insurance a little bit today. Um, and uh, the, the bottom pair uh, of uh, red and blue lines is the, the similar kind of calculation for Part A of Medicare, which covers hospitalization insurance. You can see that the tax rate is less, but actually that the, uh, the, the trend uh, situation is worse. That is, the Medicare expenditures are rising more rapidly compared to the uh, payroll tax inflow. So, so now, uh, in terms of uh, numbers, the the top row is for OASDI, and the uh, a convenient way to do this, um, we there, there are lots of ways to measure Social Security, but what I'm going to do is uh, take the infinite horizon, that is, uh, the the forecast uh, from from now as far as we can see, appropriately discounted. And uh, the number in the left corner of the table is that says that if we had an immediate uh, increase in the payroll tax rate, uh, three and a half percent, we would balance Social Security uh, now and uh, forevermore. Um, the on the on the right side, there's another way to put this, and this is the share of uh, discounted GDP over that that whole horizon. That's 1.2 percent of discounted GDP, and that's, uh, according to the trustees, the situation for Social Security. Medicare Part A, the trust fund finance part, is the, the next line down. The payroll tax uh, necessary now to balance the system is much higher than for Social Security, 5.8 percent, and the share of GDP is, is also double that for Social Security, 2.5 percent. But that's only part A of Medicare, which involves hospitalization insurance. There is also uh, part B, which involves uh, doctors, and part D, the new drug benefit. And um, the, these are not payroll tax finance, so you can't even compute the, the payroll tax deficit. But what you can do is uh, compute the present discounted value of the gross expenditures, uh, future expenditures for these plans, um, less the 1.3% uh, of GDP that we now spend on these plans and see what that uh, amounts to, and it's 4.8%. Now, if you sum the two uh, on, on the GDP side, if you sum the two uh, Medicare programs, you get uh, 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 more, seven, more than 7% 7 of GDP, which is seven times the Social Security liability. So in some sense, uh, the, the Medicare problem is seven times as bad as uh, Social Security. Social Security, as you can see, will be uh, bad enough to deal with or hard enough to deal with. Uh, the, the Medicare uh, problem is uh, almost unimaginable from a fiscal point of view. Um, I, I raise Medicare not because I'm an expert in it, I'm not. I, I, I know very little about it, but uh, one thing that I am gonna argue is um, we should uh, worry about the whole scene here, and if we talk about Social Security reform, we at least ought to do things that are roughly consistent with the types of things we know or suspect we're probably gonna have to do with uh, Medicare. Okay, so, uh, the implications of all of this, um, the, uh, we are talking about huge deficits for entitlement spending. We can talk, if you want, about marginal changes in this, that, and the other thing, but in general, they're not going to do the job, and we're talking about pretty big changes, and we might as well simply recognize that. Between the two of them, Social Security is far the lesser problem. The third point I just mentioned, Whatever we do for Social Security, it would make sense to have roughly uh, 
consistent with what we do with Medicare. So uh, what, what can we do about all this? Well, there, there are basically uh, five things. We could change uh, taxes, raise payroll taxes, or raise other taxes. I'm going to, by the way, stick to payroll taxes. We've always financed um, Social Security and Medicare that way. We could start using other taxes, but in terms of the burden on society, the, the change is going to be roughly the same. So, um, uh, I mean, you could get into a discussion of different types of taxes, but I, that's not what I'm going to focus on today. The second thing is we could cut benefit levels. Third thing is we could have people work longer careers before they start receiving benefits. Uh, the fourth thing is we could have people save more to supplement Social Security. And the fifth thing is we could permit people to invest funds differently and perhaps get a higher rate of return, though I emphasize perhaps. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a word about each of these five. And just to anticipate where I'm going, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue that we're, we'll probably need at least some of, uh, of each one of those to uh, make this problem work. Uh, it's it's uh, that big. Raising taxes uh, until now has been far and away the dominant approach. Uh, Social Security has been around for 70 years, and uh, the, the benefit levels have uh, advanced steadily up, as have uh, tax rates, as have the size of taxable payroll taxable income. Uh, the usual approach is that we, uh, we, we go ahead, we do some things, uh, Social Security has some financial difficulties, and we raise uh, payroll taxes. Um, the, we, we probably have to stop that at some point. I mean, we could keep on doing it, but there, there isn't any natural limit to this process, especially on the, the Medicare side. And so at some point, we probably have to think about changing uh, something or other on the benefit side. Uh, it's not to say we can't have uh, any more uh, tax increases. I'm, uh, I'm not that much of a s supply sider. But at some point, we probably have to get to a, a little more balanced approach in dealing with the problem. One thing that uh, I think should be recognized is that uh, the uh, the problem in uh, the, the financial problem in Social Security is often uh, 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 assigned or kind of identified by the drop dead date. When does the trust fund actually run out of assets? And that's usually a number something like 40 years into the future. And uh, in, in a political sense, uh, when do we have to act? Well, f you know, in some sense, you don't really have to act for another 40 years or so. If we wait and wait till uh, we, we really uh, confront uh, imminent uh, financial difficulties with either Social Security or Medicare, it seems to me that uh, it, it kind of pushes you in the direction of change, making changes on the tax side as opposed to the benefit side, because it's very hard to cut benefits in the short run. I think some of my panel members are going to argue that it's not impossible, and indeed it's not impossible, and they are doing it in other countries. But I think it's difficult, and we haven't done much of that in this country. And so I think in general, if, if we wait before we act, you're, you're kind of pushing the uh, balance on adjusting on the tax side. There is one uh, issue that, uh, that I think is worth considering. Social Security now taxes all payrolls at the rate of 12.4% uh, combined employer-employee, up to about 90,000 of income. And uh, one of the things that's happened in the past several years is that a lot more wage income has come in above the taxable maximum rate than below. And so we're actually taxing less wage income for Social Security than we have been earlier. And some people have argued, well, let's take up and, and capture the same uh, share of wage income. 
Uh, one thing I would point out is that for Medicare, we tax all payrolls. There is no taxable maximum, and uh, I, I would personally argue that the problems that we're facing are significant enough that we might even think of just getting rid of the, the maximum altogether. You might want to do it in phases because, and just to, to kind of spread out the burden, but, uh, but I think the uh, taxable maximum is something that in, in 10 years or so may be gone. Who knows? Okay, that's the tax side. We could also cut benefits. Uh, as I say, it's uh, difficult to do in the short run because people have uh, worked. You know, they're, uh, you're, you're, you're getting up to age 58 or something. You're making retirement plans. And then the government comes along and cuts Social Security benefits. Uh, it's difficult if you've already retired. It's difficult if you're uh, um, near retirement. And uh, we've typically shied away from that politically. Um, we, it, we, we might have to uh, rethink that. Uh, there might be ways to, to do it uh, at least somewhat. We, we do have a huge problem in front of us. Uh, one way to do it, uh, it's, it's very popular on talk shows, is by what is known as means testing. And what, what means testing means is you take people with means in their retirement years, uh, Ross Perot, think of, uh, Bill Gates, whatever, and, uh, and they've got a lot of money, so we won't uh, give them Social Security. And it, it, uh, that's very appealing uh, program for talk shows, but it actually isn't that appealing if you think about it, because what that implies is that you would be reducing the Social Security benefits of people who, number one, have uh, worked into retirement, number two, have saved a lot. And I'm going to argue that we, we actually want to encourage both of those kinds of behaviors, and we don't want to put in a formal program that has a disincentive to do that. So I don't think means testing, means testing has never been very popular with the experts on Social Security, certainly not with me. Now the, uh, the council that uh, Olivia Mitchell, who we'll talk to you later, was on, uh, came up with uh, something known as price indexing of uh, benefits. Uh, a, a few months ago, I think most people would know immediately what that is. Uh, that's, that's kind of uh, dropped out of the lexicon, and it, it's a little complicated, but let me, let me just try to make it uh, fairly simple. Social Security does something known as wage indexing of benefits. They, they bring uh, benefits up with average wage levels. What that means is that uh, there, you can focus on a concept called replacement rates, which is the first year benefit of the average worker compared to the last year wage of that average worker. And that replacement rate is right now about 42%. And it, it has actually been uh, that for two decades or so since the wage indexing system was put in. Um, if you went to price indexing of benefits, what would happen is that the benefits would not go up so much because uh, prices go up less than wages in general. And these replacement rates would gradually trend down. How far would they trend down? Well, if you did price indexing forever, they would actually trend down to zero. I mean, so, so if, you, if you go to price indexing for a very long period of time, it's probably not viable. You're just having the retirees fall too far behind uh, workers. The, uh, the, the council that recommended this came up with something called progressive indexing, where you, you do price indexing for the top, uh, I don't know, two-thirds or so of the income distribution, and you wage index at the bottom. What that means is that uh, all benefits would gravitate toward this uh, this bottom rate, and I, I would again say that that's probably not viable in the long run, that, that all people would, would get, in effect, the same uh, amount from Social Security. So I, I don't think, I, I wouldn't personally be very enthusiastic about either of those for the long run, but we might do it for a while. 
there is a hi historical uh, when when the uh, the wage in indexing was put in. Uh, there, there was a little bit of a uh, political issue at the time. Uh, the, uh, the Social Security had been uh, over-indexed for inflation. Uh, there, there were um, a lot of people uh, very upset about the change in the indexing um, procedure. This, this went to uh, what has, no, uh, has been known as the notch baby problem. It was a huge political issue, and uh, the, the, the rate at which the wage indexing was set may have been a little higher than it had to be, and it would certainly be possible to put these uh, indexing schemes in for a while, let benefits slip back some, and then, uh, and then but, but I think at that point, we would have to return to something like what we have now. But, um, but uh, anyways, that, that is something that uh, I, I wouldn't, I, I would argue uh, strenuously we shouldn't do that, uh, the, either of these indexing schemes for a long time, but we might do them for a short time. One, one thing I do uh, think uh, more favorably about is having people work longer careers. Um, I uh, did this calculation for my uh, grandparents and my grandchildren. And basically, uh, my uh, somebody in my grandparents' generation, uh, if they were lucky enough to make it to age 65, they could expect to live another 10 years or so and collect benefits. Somebody in my grandchildren's uh, uh, generation, separated by four generations, they could expect to live about uh, 22, 23 years. And so in some sense, uh, younger people get more than twice as much uh, out of the system as older people. Uh, as an intergenerational equity measure, that's uh, probably not, uh, not fair in some sense. I mean, they're, they're, it's, it's very difficult to make these calculations because there are lots of changes among uh, the generations. But I, I do think that if, um, when Social Security was first designed, if we had known that people would be living uh, so long, we probably would have built in uh, a, some sort of automatic rise in the retirement age. And I have a, a, a different paper where I try to compute what, what that ought to be, looking at both life expectancies and uh, health status and other things. And my, my preferred notion would be to raise the retirement age something like 15 months every decade. So that, you know, those of us up here on the panel, we're, we're in uh, close to retirement years already. So our age is 67. Those of you who are uh, 50, your age would be 68. Those of you who are 40, your age would be 69. It would work like that. Not a huge change. It would save quite a bit of money over time. And I think it would uh, step us in the direction of uh, better fairness across generations. An argument against this is, uh, call it the coal miner argument, that people work arduous careers and they can't uh, work this long before collecting benefits. Well, we don't have zero coal miners these days, but you'd be surprised at, at uh, how, how small the incidence of physically arduous careers are. Uh, the Labor Department computes these numbers, and I, I show, the, show them in the paper. And uh, by the time we, we would get around to doing this, you're talking about 3 or 4% of the workforce. I mean, it really isn't uh, that uh, big of an issue. I'm uh, running out of time, so I'm going to move ahead here. Um, next issue is, could we have people save more? Uh, Americans don't save that much. Uh, the overall personal saving rate is, uh, is, uh, seems to be stuck at zero. Uh, some of my old former colleagues at the board think once uh, we, we get out of the re housing refinance binge, saving rates will uh, move up again. I am unpersuaded about that. Um, for roughly half the population, Social Security comprises close to 90% of retiree living support. 
When we did the uh, council 10 years ago, I, I uh, tried to address this by suggesting mandatory add-on small saving accounts, 2% uh, of payroll. The idea was that if you out there were already saving, uh, that's great, my congratulations, and you could reduce your other saving by the 2% of payroll. If you're, if you're already doing the right thing, then it, it shouldn't affect you. But, uh, you know, two-thirds of you probably are not saving enough or, or maybe saving zero, and uh, you'd have to save more. So I thought it was nicely designed to, to deal with that. Uh, it wasn't a uh, political uh, favorite, uh, it never will be, and so we may, I mean, I could still talk about it, but it's kind of a waste of time, so I won't. Uh, the, uh, the president has proposed a different kind of uh, individual account, uh, what is known as a carve-out account, where you carve it out of the regular payroll tax that people pay, and uh, I, I think that um, that is likely to reduce national saving. And my reasoning for that is that right now, all of you are thinking about retirement saving to the extent you, you are thinking about retirement saving. Social Security is there. You probably don't take it into account much and you save what you save. If you uh, replaced your payroll tax with an individual account, started getting statements, You'd probably see these statements and, wow, I'm really building up money in my accounts. And, and my guess is you'd be reducing your other saving. And so I think uh, the, uh, a carve-out account is liable to go the wrong way in that sense. Um, a lot of people have talked about tax subsidies for uh, saving. And, the, um, you know, nothing theoretically uh, wrong with that. But I... Th but, uh, what, what I think has been the dominant uh, experience is that people have um, had these tax incentives. They have not increased their saving. They have converted their existing wealth to tax preferred form. The government loses money and they don't save anymore and national saving goes down. And uh, so I'm not so high on that one either. The only thing that, uh, that I think might uh, work in this area is that uh, for people working in uh, corporations with um, defined contribution plans called 401k plans, right now you have the opt-in option. You go to work, do you want to be part of our, our uh, defined contribution plan? Yes or no? If you say yes, you're in. So what about if we reversed it and made it opt out that you're automatically enrolled uh, at, at a certain percent of your salary and your money is invested, say, in bonds, and uh, you can take steps to opt out. They, they've actually done experiments with this, and that has raised the saving rate. So that might be something we could get away with. We, we probably won't get away with that on accounts. Uh, the, the next one, and it, it, this is a hugely complicated issue, I don't have much time, so I'll, I'll try to go through it pretty quickly, uh, is uh, permit uh, people to invest their funds differently and get a higher rate of return. Basically, it's impossible. Uh, and and let, me, uh, uh, let, let me quickly go through the argument. First off, as the first bullet point uh, suggests, the, uh, a pure pay-as-you-go pension plan has a rate of return equal, equal to the equilibrium growth of real earnings, which is roughly 3% or so. This has been uh, as the proposition of Paul Samuelson something like uh, 50 years ago. Um, we do have legacy costs with Social Security. That is, we paid out full benefits before uh, people had worked full careers, and so that actually... Uh, sits there is a little bit of a tax on everybody who's come later. There's also redistribution in Social Security, so high-income people get somewhat lower returns than this average. And so that reduces the return for Social Security by, by something below the 3%. Um, these carve-out individual accounts I mentioned, uh, the I mean, the, the basic macroeconomic proposition is if you haven't changed the stock of capital, uh, 
you, uh, you, you can't change the overall return on that capital. And if you haven't raised national saving, you can't change the overall stock of capital. And so if you haven't raised national saving, you're probably not going to uh, raise the overall return and carve out individual accounts, as I just argued, I don't think would raise national saving. Add-on individual accounts could, uh, but probably not hugely. There, there are economic reasons why the marginal return may be slightly greater than the average. Uh, it's been suggested we let people invest in stocks instead of bonds. Uh, right now, implicitly, I mean, uh, uh, you, you know, change the investment portfolio. Um, if you're, if, if you believe in uh, the usual postulate of capital markets, looking ahead, the risk-adjusted rate of returns on stocks and bonds ought to be the same. If it weren't the same, we would reallocate portfolios. So I, I don't think there is much here. This is a, a complicated issue, one that uh, is uh, debated. I, I think it's uh, largely, um, the, the debate is largely misplaced. The one thing I would say about this is there, there is risk. If we start letting people invest, there is risk. And um, one, one of the things that we are observing now is the demise of the corporate defined benefit system. We, we have permitted uh, uh, corporations to improperly fund their defined benefit systems. A lot of them are closing down. And uh, in the end, the only defined benefit system we, we may have, the only viable defined benefit system we may have in this country is Social Security. Uh, defined contribution systems where you invest your own money are great, but they do entail individuals taking all the investment risk. Defined benefit, the sponsor of the plan, takes the investment risk. And so given that the corporate defined benefit system is disappearing, uh, I, I think we should ask ourselves, do we want to have individuals take a huge amount of additional or even a little uh, additional investment risk on their Social Security? I would say no. I think it's, uh, it's um, a, a good balance to have a, um, a government-defined benefit system to backstop people. So, um, so let me uh, quickly summarize. Um, the, um, even though I started you off with good news, uh, people living longer, et cetera, uh, the, w we, we've got a very significant financial problem here uh, in terms of percent of payroll just for Part A of Medicare and Social Security. Uh, it adds to uh, a little, little more than 10% of payroll is that right? Did I do the numbers right? Through? No, 9.3% 9, 9 of payroll. Uh, and that's, that's ignoring parts D and uh, B and D of uh, Medicare, which are, as you remember, the, the first slide, uh, even, even bigger as a share of GDP. So we got a significant problem. If we, if we throw a lot of good stuff at it, uh, let's eliminate the taxable maximum uh, let's change the retirement age in the way I said. Let's do uh, progressive indexing for a while. Let's make some other changes. Uh, I, any, any of those could probably get me assassinated if I were actually running for office. But together, they add to 4% of payroll, less than half the way there. And we're not even talking about the big problems. So, while it's great that we're living longer, we, we have, uh, in so doing, put a, a significant financial burden on, on ourselves. Marginal changes won't do it. Uh, we, we've got uh, very, we, we've got to think about very big changes. You may not like mine, that's fine, but we got to do something, and, uh, and uh, the earlier we do it, the better. Thank you very much. I mean, just, I, uh, we, we all want to hear what the panel has to say, but if you want to get at me right away, uh, Becky's given a, a brief time to do that. Yeah. Okay, I, uh, it, it's hard to hear, yeah. So.
uh, you know, percent of payroll. But uh, back in the dark ages, that used to be calculated at 1% of payroll. Uh, do you have any data on what that has cost us? And would you include eliminating that in your um, proposed uh, remedy of increasing the uh, retirement age? I, I think the implication of that uh, on the overall finances of the system was uh, uh, pretty close to zero, actually. Um, it, uh, yeah. Pardon? There, there is something called the delayed retirement credit, and that, uh, uh, you, you know, you, you get an actual reduction in benefits if you retire early. You get an uh, increase in actual increase in benefits if you retire late. And uh, the, uh, the so-called Social Security earnings test, um, I, you know, it would affect some people, but it, it's just not significant as an overall factor. Let me uh, toss onto the table a couple of other alternatives or additional things. Um, hi, hi, Peter. Hi. <laughs> Good to see you. Uh, welcome back. Um, one would be the current plan to abolish the inheritance tax. Um, if we instead took a liberalized inheritance tax, generous exemptions, uh, and instead allocated that entirely, earmarked it legally for Social Security, we, we could make a, a significant impact. I don't have the figures in front of me, but it would, it would solve a good 30% uh, uh, of the deficit or something over 75 years. Um, another one, maybe less important, but I think uh, fair, is to require new hires at the state and local level all to participate in the system. Um, in many cases, there's a lot of freeloading at the end because they retire yeah. and do second jobs and still get Social Security. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and one you haven't talked about, I think we have privately in the past, is instead of letting individuals choose alternative investments, uh, have the system as a whole engage in alternative investments. And personally, I would say stocks and bonds uh, state and local government, corporation, private hospital bonds, overseas stocks and bonds. I personally would say put the whole, all additions to the portfolio in those things, not only to increase the rate of return, but to avoid the tremendous disgorgement costs, the impact that's going to occur on the federal budget when all of a sudden, instead of receiving a tremendous subsidy from Social Security, it has to pay out hundreds of billions of dollars a year uh, into, this, into the trust funds? Uh, you're, uh, you're dead right on state and local workers. They ought to be part of the system. I think every good government approach to Social Security has uh, suggested that, and just, just for the reason you say. Uh, I don't think uh, you get much from uh, what is known as central fund uh, equity investment or investment in hospital bonds. The, the proposition of capital markets is that risk-adjusted rates of return on all these assets ought to be the same. Now, at, at an earlier session this year, uh, Professor or, uh, Dr. Aaron of the Brookings Institution, that uh, who, who you're about to hear from, uh, said, well, that's true for uh, individual investments, but if you have the central fund hold the equities, uh, they don't have to sell the equities at a particular time, and maybe the, the rate of return would be uh, higher. Uh, I actually, it was an intriguing idea, and I actually had our financial guys at the Fed work on that, and they sent me a memo, uh, and uh, basically that's trivial too. I mean, you, you just can't get much. Uh, I mean, maybe their memo was wrong. It got, it got into some pretty dicey uh, uh, calculations, but uh, but you can't get much from, uh, in my view, from central fund uh, equity investment either. But tell me again what your first thing was. Inheritance the inheritance tax. Uh, I I agree with you. I I would like to uh, see the inheritance tax stay. 
Uh, I think it's uh, uh, removing it would be a mistake. But I actually don't agree with saying, well, we got this nice tax idea. Let's go around and use that for Social Security. Um, and the reason I don't agree is that I think it sweeps the problem under the rug. Uh, we, we have a problem here. We've got to confront it. And just to say, well, we can use this other tax uh, strikes me as irresponsible budgeting. We, we got a lot of things we got to do with our tax system. And uh, I think, uh, you know, my, my view of this is we're, uh, we're living longer. Uh, our birth rates have uh, stabilized at an acceptable level. We ought to be able to figure out how to finance entitlement spending internally and not pick up a lot of other taxes to uh, pay for it, however meritorious those other taxes are. Quick questions. Um, one is, um, what happens to the, the OS, OASDI deficit after the baby boomers die off? Does Keeps this, going up. It continues to go up. Yeah. I mean, we had that chart. Do you right. want to put the, the first chart up there? It just keeps going up. It, it doesn't go up the same slope, but it keeps going up. So, okay. So, because I'll, we're still living longer. Okay. Um, the, the nice thing about central investment of the funds, yeah. however. It, it's just going up. Okay. Is that it keeps the federal government from spending it. What? The, the Social Security surplus. Because, I mean, the bigger problem right now is, oh, that, is yeah. the fact that we're spending the surplus as right. opposed to... Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, we, the, right now, there, there is a cash surplus for Social Security, um, and uh, the, uh, arguably, right now, what that's doing uh, is, um, is reducing the deficit below what it would otherwise be, and uh, there, there's a raging empirical debate about does that uh, lead for more, less responsible fiscal policy. Maybe it does. But remember that pretty soon that Social Security surplus is going to be a deficit. And whatever it does now, presumably it ought to, ought to go the other way uh, in when it, whenever the lines cross. Um, so, so I, uh, you know, I think you could argue for taking Social Security out of the budget, making the Congress balance the general budget. I've, I've often made that argument in the past. Uh, that would, uh, might help on overall fiscal policy. Uh, it, it ain't going to help much on the problem we're talking about today. My question is one of timing and urgency. On the counterfactual of not moving for one reason or another, the politics of it, that sort of thing, um, how long can one can we expect that to sort of be uh, somewhat comparable to this period of time versus the markets really starting to react to that and forcing some sorts of drastic adjustments? Um, it's it's hard to know about markets. I mean, I'm, I'm just coming back from the Fed, and we're we're supposed to be quite uh, expert in all that. But uh, you, you know, the the markets, uh, in in their wisdom, have known about large and outsized forecast deficits for a long time now, and you'd think you'd see something in long-term interest rates. Uh, we don't. This is uh, what Mr. Greenspan labeled the conundrum, and he, uh, he actually got a lot of financial traders to uh, consult their dictionary, I think, for the first time ever and, and calling it that. Uh, we all know, now know what a conundrum is, and uh, long-term bond rates are a conundrum. Uh, part of the reason for the so-called conundrum is that uh, what's going on here which I'll call undersaving, is uh, probably exactly what's go the, the reverse of what's going on in, in much of the rest of the world, and global markets are, I mean, markets are global now. And so it could be that uh, the very high saving of uh, many other countries is uh, keeping our interest rates from going up. Um, and it's... I guess it's hard for me to, whatever is going on, it's hard for me to see why 
uh, anything, what, what new was added to all that? Uh, you know, the, uh, we give this speech today and, oh yeah, these, these deficits are bad, but people should have known that. And already we have a conundrum, so I, I, I wouldn't, um, in, in terms of kind of economic predictions from all this, I think that you'd be, uh, well, I wouldn't, wouldn't bet a lot of money that uh, you're, you're going to see a rise in long-term interest rates. Uh, and according to the economic textbooks, you should, but I wouldn't bet a lot of money on it. One more, and we'll move to the panel. You don't even have to have that. Uh, going, going, gone. Thank you very much. <laughs>I'm going to give us all a five-minute stretch break while we set the panel up, and we'll start um, five after three, according to my watch. I think we're um, ready to start up again. If there's um, anyone who's joined us, um, I welcome you all to our Forum on Social Security Reform, co-sponsored by the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy and the National Poverty Center, which is located at the Ford School. Um, Dr. Edward Gramlich has just given us a keynote speech, and we're about to launch into a panel discussion with just a wonderful group of experts, and I want to introduce Aaron Lobotsky. Um, who is a visiting professor from the University of Illinois who has worked on a variety of related issues and is going to moderate the panel. Darren. Thank you, Dean Blank. Uh, I am Darren Lobotsky and I'm visiting the Ford School this year uh, and I'm delighted to be part of this uh, panel discussion. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Dean Blank and the Ford School and the uh, National Poverty Center for hosting this forum. Um, I'd like to get started by reintroducing the panel members for those of you who may have just arrived. Uh, Bob Willis will start off. He is a professor at the University of Michigan, Department of Economics, the Survey Research Center, and the Population Studies Center. As Dean Blank mentioned earlier, uh, he directs two of the largest and most important studies that we have on the health and labor market outcomes and uh, financial conditions of the elderly and near elderly in the United States, namely the health and retirement study and the a head study. Dr. Willis has written widely on fertility, intergenerational transfers, and the well-being of the elderly. Welcome, Dr. Willis. I'm just going to introduce everybody first. I'm going to introduce everybody first. <laughs> You'll be more welcome in a minute. <laughs> uh, Dr. Olivia Mitchell is the International Foundation of Employee Benefit Plans Professor of Insurance and Risk Management and Business and Public Policy at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. She's also the Executive Director of the Pension Research Council and Director of the Botner Center for Pensions and Retirement Research. She was recently a member of President Bush's Commission for Strengthening Social Security. She's the co-author with Robert Clark of the forthcoming book, Reinventing the Retirement Paradigm. Welcome, Dr. Mitchell. Finally, Henry Aaron is the Bruce and Virginia McLaurie Chair and Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. He chaired the 1979 Advisory Council on Social Security and is a member of the Institute of Medicine, Chairman of the Board of Directors of the National Academy of Social Insurance, and former Vice President of the American Economics Association. He is co-author with Robert Reischauer, of the book Countdown to Reform, The Great Social Security Debate, as well as the forthcoming book, Strengthening Medicare for the 21st Century. Welcome, Dr. Aaron. I'm, I'm honored to be part of the program with these distinguished scholars. Each one is gonna talk to you for about 15 or 20 minutes, and then we'll go through to the panel again for about three or four minutes and have them comment on each other's presentations. And then at the end, we'll open up the floor to questions. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Willis, please begin. Okay, <clears throat> thanks. I've actually uh, been given a task to uh, to talk about uh, the kind of the demographic background to issues having to do with Social Security, and so I'm actually not going to be in any particular way taking a position on on uh, on on particular policies. I think that Olivia and Henry are going to be uh, doing that. So I want I really want to kind of set the stage, and maybe we could uh, have the first <clears throat> thing. 
Uh, as it was mentioned, I'm heading the uh, Health and Retirement Study, which is a study of uh, the entire U.S. population, a representative study of the U.S. population over the age of 50, and it's a very holistic study. And what I've given in this slide and the next is a set of issues that uh, confront uh, uh, people who want to study aging in America, and particularly aging in an aging society, uh, where individuals are aging, but the society as a whole as having its cha a change in the age distribution, and uh, I'm, going to do I'm going to do that. So there's a changing demographic landscape that I'm going to be talking about. There's a, there's a baby boom, and, and, a <clears throat> and, and the boomers are, are approaching retirement. There's a growth in longevity, as, as Ned mentioned. Uh, there's also been a, a, a divorce revolution and changes in family structure, that, which really didn't uh, come up in the earlier discussion is not going to come up that much in my discussion, but I think is a terribly important, important issue that we need to deal with. The position of women, the position of the relationships between generations are getting much more complicated than they've been in the past, and we're starting to see that in the early boomers who are now approaching retirement. There's a changing landscape of work and retirement. Uh, as has been mentioned, the, uh, there's been a replacement of defined benefit pension plans by defined contribution plans to a large extent. There's been an increase in uh, things like vehicles like 401ks. There's been uh, a decrease in employer health insurance. There's been, uh, uh, in, and in general, there's been an increased scope for decision making by individuals concerning their retirement. There are more things that are determined by choices and decisions and fewer things that are being determined by formulas and, 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 and laws. And this increase in complexity of decision making is, is uh, I think, an important thing that, that we need to be aware of in, uh, in thinking about policies. Uh, will people make wise decisions? Uh, <clears throat> there's also <clears throat> been changing epidemiological and healthcare trends. Uh, as, as, been, as Ned emphasized, there's a uh, uh, very rapidly rising expenditures on health care. And what makes this difficult is there's also been very rapidly rising uh, improvements in the technology of health. It was uh, a century ago, doctors probably did more harm than good, and maybe now they may do, be do, doing more good than harm. And uh, so there are rapid changes there, and so issues about how much we should spend on that is an issue that's not just a matter of fiscal policy, but it's a matter of, it's a matter of uh, what would be the appropriate allocation of resources to those issues. There are trends in obesity that are running against the general trend of better health, and there are, uh, is a growing risk of, uh, of ending life in, with dementia. Uh, and the reason for that is that as we live longer, and competing causes of death like heart disease or cancer are dealt with, the uh, risks of dementia, Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia really aren't foreseen to change. And that means that more people will be ending their life in that stage. And that has major cost implications, some of which are on the, family, on the, on the national budget, public budget, but many of which are in family budgets. And not just money budgets, but also time budgets and emotional budgets. And we need to, we need to think about those too. Finally, there are uh, issues of changing policies, debates on Social Security that we're talking about now, uh, issues about Medicaid, which is a topic that hadn't really come up. Uh, there are issues about the Medicare prescription drug program tax reform. We've argued that the data that we're collecting is, is relevant to all of those things, and I'm only going to just touch the bare surface of remarks uh, today on, on some of these things. Let me turn to the first thing I want to talk about is the U.S. situation, the demographic situation, and let's have an, <clears throat> the first slide. This shows the uh, uh, baby boom and baby bust from the point, point of view of cohort fertility. The cohort fertility is a measure of the number of children that women actually bear, and so the horizontal axis is the uh, is women who were born in 1910, for example, had under 2.4 children on average. A large part of the reason for that is a large number of those women were childless, which is this other red line here, and you can see the, the scale for the childlessness is on the right, and the scale for number of children per woman is on the left. And uh, what you can see is that there was a baby boom, that women after 1910 progressively had more children until the women who were born around 19, uh, the late 1930s. And then there was a decline in fertility 
fertility since then. And you can see now that uh, one of the recent trends is that the rate of childlessness is actually increasing once again. And, and when you're thinking about intergenerational issues, being childless means that you do not have a next generation there. And that raises a set, set, of, set of issues that uh, need to be thought about. Let me go to the next slide. The implications of the baby of the uh, baby boom and the baby bust are shown here, and this is these are really, I think, is a very interesting chart that I found somebody created on they swiped it off the web. I've forgotten where I got it from, but it's a nice it's a nice chart, and it uh, and it, what it shows is the number of the number of births that in each year during the uh, from 1910 till 2005, and what you can see is that there the um, a uh, number of births was very small, then it rose really dramatically between 1935, uh, where it reached the bottom, up to the top of the baby boom in 1965, which, and then there was subsequent fall in fertility. And there was a baby bust that was sitting there. But then what you see over on the right-hand side is not so well known as this sort of echo. Each woman was having fewer children, but there were so many women. <laughs> who are produced by the boomers, that they're starting to produce children. And indeed, a lot of the things that will distinguish the United States from other societies in terms of its age structure is really uh, because of this, this echo boom, uh, or at least in good part. Let's uh, have the next slide. Uh, so this just gives you a sort of way in which the boomers traveled through the US age distribution. If you look up in the upper left-hand corner, we've got these age pyramids. As you'll see, the term pyramid is, is, is going to be something that's going to go out of fashion. It's going to turn out to be the age top or <laughs> whatever something is that stands on, <laughs> stands on a pointed end. But we still have a pyramid there in, in 1975. And the boomers initially congested the schools when they were 10 to 25. And then uh, in, a, in, in a pictures not showing, they entered the labor market in very large numbers. And then by 2010, they uh, became age 45 to 64. And we're sort of sitting just before 2010, five years before that. And, and it's the boomers are really approaching retirement. And that's what's causing lots of discussion. Because if, if, we, if you remember the last uh, chart, the people who were down at the bottom of the numbers of births were people who were like 65 to 70 now, people born 1930 to 40. The people who are at the top of the chart, <laughs> Very numerous are these are these boomers, and that's what's going to change the age distribution. And here, in 2030 and 2050, you can see how they work their way through the age distribution. Somebody saying like a a, a rat through an anaconda. <clears throat> so now let's uh, let's uh, move to the next chart. I want to put the uh, U.S. into uh, uh, global context. I think Ned alluded to this, but I want to make it a little more explicit than he did. There's been rapid population aging throughout the world. And it's been a consequence, really, of fertility decline and increasing longevity. And I'm going to talk about both of those. And the U.S. is experiencing less rapid aging than most other societies. So, so we're, we're in a less, in some sense, uh, 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 rapidly changing and desperate situation than some other countries. We have the next chart. So here's a, here's a set of the countries that, in the proportion of the population over 65, where the top uh, the, the top um, 20 is given, and then the United States is down at the bottom. It's not even close to the top 20. And you can see the champions in, uh, of the aging societies are places like Italy is the number one. Uh, Japan is way up there. Uh, you probably knew about both, them, both of them. Greece is kind of a little bit of a surprise up there. Germany, Spain, Sweden, and so on. So, uh, so many countries are much, have a much higher proportion of aged population than we do, 20% compared to, say, 12%. Next slide. Well, the, reason, the major reason for this is this worldwide fertility decline. And I've just put up, I'm not going to spend very much time on this chart, but it's just to show you a sampling of different countries that have had fertility declines. Uh, the United Kingdom and France and Finland and Denmark you can see up there, many people think of the Scandinavians as low fertility countries, but they're not anymore. If you look down in the lower left hand corner, Spain and Italy and Greece, you can see they went from being very high fertility countries 
to being extremely low fertility countries, and Italy now has, has on average one child per woman. Well, if you think about that, that's half of a replacement, which would mean that in steady, in a in long run equilibrium, the Italian population size would fall by half every generation. So if there are 100 million or 50 million, or 70 million, I suppose now, uh, it, it would go to 35 million in 25 years and half of that in, in uh, 50 years and so forth. I once told an Italian that I wanted to meet him because I wanted to be there be while there were still Italians on the face of the planet. They're going extinct. And he said, yes, we're like pandas. We're an endangered species. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, the, um, uh, you can see Eastern Europe. Uh, I'm going to come back to the U.S., Australia, and then China and Taiwan. During this last decade, the U.S. is the only industrialized country that with fertility above replacement. It might have re dropped below replacement, I think, in 2003. Next. And the, uh, the other place I want, to look, want you to look, because this is really important for the rest of, uh, for the, rest of the century, is the, um, are these countries in the Asia. Uh, here you have China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. Look at China. They went from seven births per woman in 1965 to um, uh, down to uh, well below two births per woman. This is an extraordinarily rapid change in fertility, unprecedented in human history, and it will cause unprecedented rapidity in the change of age distributions. Let's go on. This is some age pyramids, just to give you a comparison between the United States and Italy. And you can see in the uh, U.S. case that we already went through that the U.S. age distribution changes. Um, but it remains, even in 2050, it remains a, uh, a kind of pyramid, not a sharp pyramid, but sort of pyramidal. And it also, the size of the population remains the same. If you look over in Italy, you see this very rapid progression of population uh, that's aging. And you can see an actual inversion of the age pyramid over here, so that a very small number of young people, a very large number of old people, this is going to be an old society. You also see the whole area of these charts declining from top to bottom, which is my uh, asymptotically disappearing Italian population. Uh, next chart. Here is a, a case. I just came back from Korea a couple weeks ago and became really quite fascinated by them. They claim now to be the most rapidly aging country in the world. Korea had its fertility fall from uh, uh, there. You can see around four, uh, uh, I guess about, I can't read the scale quite, but probably about 4.6 or so children in uh, per woman in 1970 to uh, 1.16 children in 2005. They claim that's the lowest fertility on Earth, although the, Hong Kong and parts of Italy are probably uh, c close competitors. The, because of that change, their population, no, please go back. Because of that change, their population is, is uh, uh, going to be aging extremely rapidly. And they have no pension plans, no employer pension plans. They have no social security system. They have a fairly rudimentary health care system. So you might think that they could start things from scratch, that they don't have all of these legacy costs that Ned remembers. Remember, but that's actually not true. The uh, Asian societies are famous for having the, the young people tend to help the old people in old age, their old age support. Well, now the young people are not having any children of their own. They know they have to save for their old age. What do they do about the old people? Well, that's a legacy cost. It's not on the public books, but it's in the social books. And uh, they really need to consider that. Let's go on. I want to go to, to mortality um, and, and mortality decline very quickly, and let me go, get one. Here's the U.S. growth in, in uh, age uh, in length of life uh, for women. It went from from uh, uh, let's see from 60 to 75, and for men, or uh, for men, it went from 60 to 75. For women, uh, another t uh, 10 years or five years. Uh, on each side. Let's go to the next one. This is a really quite remarkable graph. This is from a, sci a paper in Science Magazine by James Volpel and, and Jim Open. And it uh, shows that there's been a gain in world length of life 
uh, uh, 40, uh, 40 years over, the ne uh, over 160 years, and if you measure the, link, the possible length of life by what's the expectation of life in the country that has currently the highest level of, ex uh, level of longevity, it's been a straight line. If that straight line were to continue, that would, uh, that's, that straight line has been one-fourth of a year of extra length of life every, every year. If that were to continue another, the next 50 years, that would raise female life expectancy from 80 to 95. Uh, it's uh, this is a very unexpected relationship. You can see the U.S. used to be a champion, but it's sort of fallen off. You can see Japan is the current champion. And who knows who's going to be the future champion. Uh, this, uh, uh, th this aging is much more rapid than is projected by the uh, actuary's office. So. That's another fundamental thing about these demographic things. They're, the, number, the charts that you've seen about the future make you believe that the future's certain. <laughs> that just ain't true. There's a lot of uncertainty about mortality. There's a lot of uncertainty about uh, fertility. And there's even more uncertainty, uncertainty about uh, uh, income and, and, uh, and productivity growth. Let's go on to the next slide. Most of these years of life that are gained will be at old ages, ages after 65. It's, I'm going to speed up here. Um, and, uh, the, uh, and this is sort of a, a chart that shows this, this increasing probability of dementia at l later ages. And this is from the health and retirement study. That prior chart was as well that shows sort of what's the implication for informal caregivers who are largely family members is that a person who's severely demented becomes really a full-time, a 40-hour-a-week job. That's not, on our, that's not on our national income accounts, and it's not in our fiscal accounts. It, but it may be, trend, but if you now think about the increasing number of people who are childless or the people who have divorces and so forth, those numbers could end up in our, in our books. <laughs> Go ahead. <clears throat> um, so what's the problem? Well, I, I want to just underline really what Ned talked about, that the, in general, trends uh, in fertility and mortali mortality are potentially welfare enhancing. At the macroeconomic level, they would permit higher capital labor ratios in, in, in long-run uh, equilibrium growth. Uh, there are higher levels of human capital per worker. There are higher levels of per capita income. At the family level, parents in, are freely choosing fewer children, China aside, where there's been the one-child policy that's covered part of China. Um, there's investing more in each child's education and health. In Korea, for example, current levels of education in Korea are at or above U.S. levels, whereas 30 years ago they were uh, at the grade school level. So there, there's just been enormous investment by generations in their children. The higher lifetime incomes of successive generations, again, in some of the Asian countries, that could be by an order of magnitude higher. Uh, there's a longer le length of life. So what's the problem? Well, the changing age structure is a challenge because a aged individuals face decreasing health and productivity. There's great in individual uncertainty, uncertainty at the individual level and their diminished capacity to respond to older ages. Um, the uh, intergenerational transfers uh, and how can we deal with those? Well, there are kind of two types of social institutions. One is one set of institutions deals with intergenerational transfers, the family and the state. And I, as I mentioned, the legacy costs can create a, a difficulty in making transitions from, from, say, the state to the market, but also from the family to the market. Market alternatives include private savings, private insurance and annuities, life cycle labor supply. Go ahead. This is kind of the age sensitivity of, of these things. This is a plot due to Ron Lee uh, of uh, 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 essentially government benefits received by age, and you can see that the benefits at the end of life dwarf the benefits at the beginning of life. And here's a, a chart of the age distribution of taxes, and they're more centered in life. And here you can see what I think is a terribly important thing to bear in mind. This is an overall scheme that Ron Lee has developed, uh, which uh, uh, does uh, the magnitude and direction of intergenerational transfers um, uh, for both within families, privately and publicly. And you can see that the private sector, the transfers are always from the older, almost always from the older generation to the younger generation. 
That's child rearing, that's education of children, that's bequests and transfer gifts and transfers. The public sector has basically taken over from the family. What was done in, say, Korea in the past or other countries where the, where the old age part had, was where the family business is now a public business with the small exception of support for education. And, uh, and, that's, and, 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 and that's where the age distribution issues come in. Those transfers from young to old are easy when there are a lot of young and not many old and hard otherwise. Um, work and retirement, um, there's been, a, 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 I think, a reversal. I'm not going to, I'm running, going to run out of time, so let me just go through, through the pictures here. So why don't you... This is what uh, is the uh, uh, original HRS cohort that's been followed from the time they were 51 to 61 in 1992 until, uh, until uh, I think this picture was drawn based on 2002 data. And, it, and it's sort of a picture that shows the uh, blue line and the red line indicate the proportion retired and the green dotted line in, uh, uh, shows what's technically known as the hazard of retirement or the likelihood that people leave. You can see a spike at 62. About half of people are retired by age 62. Ned mentioned, what about working longer? Why don't we go ahead? Well, in 2004, uh, the HRS introduced the, the, young, the baby boomers uh, who are approaching. These are people who were born 1948 to 53, so they participated in the baby boom. They're going to be in their 60s around 2010 when we saw that big bulge before, they were asked how, how likely it is that they were to work uh, full time after age 65. And you could see a really substantial increase among both men and women in that fraction. So it does look like the long-term decline in uh, labor force participation may be reversing itself. And uh, the... Uh, uh, so so we, we have a set of problems. We need to deal with the family structure. We need to deal with the wage structure growing more unequal. Uh, uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of inequality that's masked by the averages that I've been showing. Uh, there's an open question whether healthy years of life will grow apace with years of life. And let me conclude with this, which... Uh, <laughs> that, uh, we, hope, uh, we hope that we do better than she did. Our next speaker is Dr. Olivia Mitchell. Good afternoon. Since I'm short, I was going to try to use this microphone. I find I tend to disappear behind these uh, podia. So um, thank you very much to Dean Blank and all her colleagues at the Ford School. It's a great pleasure to be back here in Ann Arbor, um, and especially in honor of Ned Gramlich. I've worked with him numerous times over the years, and he has many, many talents, many of whom which you saw this afternoon. I find him to be a great intellect, a wonderful diplomat, and a super leader. And so it's a, it's a privilege to be here to participate in this session. I have to applaud Michigan for bringing him back home. I'm not sure whether I should offer him congratulations or condolences on becoming acting provost. On the other hand, speaking as an economist, of course, economics is called the dismal science. And he may have more fun in his administrative capacity than being an economist after we go through more of this discussion today. It will become even more obvious. At any rate, um, let me just uh, reiterate some of the themes, maybe cast them in somewhat different terms. Next slide, please. Um, as many people are fond of saying in the U.S., retirement security really relies on what we call the three-legged stool. There, we don't rely completely on government. We rely on multiple different pillars of support in retirement. So we have the private component. Uh, Bob has just told us about people working longer, private saving, and so on. We have employment-based pensions, which are not in great shape at the moment. Perhaps we can come back to that later. But our focus today is Social Security. One thing I would note is when I talk in Europe, they say to me, oh, no, you have the wrong image. It's not a three-legged stool. It's like a cappuccino. In Europe, they have the model that the, the liquid part, the coffee and the milk together, that's government. 
the foam on top of the cappuccino, that's the pension. And the sprinkled cinnamon or chocolate or whatever you have on the top of your cappuccino, that's private saving. So the relative roles of these obviously vary a lot across country, across culture, across civilization. So just to um, re-emphasize the importance of some of the work being done here at the University of Michigan, we have a survey that known as the Health and Retirement Study. If there are students in the audience that are interested in research projects, this is a gold mine. It's a wonderful, wonderful survey. This happens to represent by wealth ventile, that is the poorest folks on the left, the richest folks on the right, the proportion of their wealth as surveyed on the verge of retirement. So what we see is the poorest folks, they're in trouble. They basically only have social security to, re to retire on, and then they're in debt. That's why things look bad for them. At the right hand side, you see people who have substantial personal wealth. Maybe some of them are business owners. They're not really the case that we're worried about. But what you see is the relative importance of Social Security is very strong for the bottom, let's say, third of the wealth distribution. Even right in the middle, the median ventile, two fifths of their wealth looking into retirement is Social Security. About one fifth is their home equity. One-fifth is private saving, and one-fifth is their pension. So we have a little bit of a balance, better in this country than in many countries, but obviously Social Security is still a very important component. You've seen this graph before. Let me just bring it home to you again with the fact that Social Security faces looming shortfalls. What we see first off is the, the near-term problem. Take a little bit of an issue with Ned's point that, well, we don't really have to worry for 40 years. First of all, 40 years comes a lot quicker than you think. The second point is that we do have to worry much sooner than that. We should start worrying now because within about 13 years, give or take a little bit, the surplus of Social Security will be gone. That is, there will no longer be enough payroll tax taken in to pay promised benefits. Now you can say, well, that's no problem because we have this file cabinet in West Virginia with approximately $1.7 trillion of IOUs, which represent the trust fund. And that's true. This file cabinet exists. I have pictures of it in my office. I will share them with you if you wish. But the fact is there's no money behind those promises. The federal government has said it will come up with the money, but there's no dedicated source of revenue to pay those benefits within approximately 13 years. So the, I believe the problem is a near-term problem. The commission that I served on said, really, we shouldn't be thinking about 40 years. The crunch will start to come now. And in 2042, that's when the Social Security Trust Fund drawers are empty. And I suspect many of the people in this room will still be here that in the, at that time point. The only options at that point, if there's no reform, are either to reduce benefits, and just click one more time, or raise taxes. The other point I would make to you is that this long-term unfunded liability is of substantial magnitude. Ned showed you some numbers, just to put it in concrete terms. If you compute in today's dollars, what the present value, the unfunded liability is, it's about $11 trillion. Anybody know the size of the US GDP? About $11 trillion. So if you took the whole value of what we produce, that would be enough with nothing much left over to finance unfunded liability. That gives you a relative sense. To put it differently, not that we would do this, but if you were to ask every worker to cough up enough money to finance the system, set it straight and go forward, the amount of money every worker would have to contribute would be on the order of $78,000 per person. That just solves the old problems and then we have to save for our own retirement going forward. How many people have $78,000 sitting around needing needing to be given to the government to finance Social Security. It's a big and daunting task. What do we do about the present value of this shortfall? I believe it's massive political risk. A lot of people say, oh, the Social Security system represents safety, individual investments represent risk, wrong. And there's an old Chinese proverb that says, the couple that goes to bed early to save on candles 
wakes up with twins. <laughs> What's the point? There's risk in everything. There is nothing like safety. What are your choices? If you do nothing, the benefits will be reduced by about a third when the money runs out. Personally, I don't want to be 82 years old or 84 years old and be told, oh, by the way, your benefits are going to be cut by a third. We have to fix it now. You could raise taxes. That would require a hike in payroll taxes by 50 to 80 percent, depending on when you do it. And, and another sort of comment I would make about one of Ned's proposals is even if you uncapped the Social Security wage base and subjected all of Social Security, all of earnings to Social Security taxes, that would only push forward the date of insolvency by six years. It sounds big. It is small compared to the size of the problem. This means Social Security is very risky, and every year we wait, it gets worse. So how do we get into this math mess? Part of it's simple math. As both Bob and Ned have pointed out, we used to have a lot of workers and a few retirees. Now we have few workers and a lot of retirees. There are other reasons, and I think we should mention them. It's just not the baby boomer's fault. I think we have to understand that. It's the fact that people have retired earlier, so we're supporting them longer. People are living longer, we, and I think the risk is, of course, they're going to live a lot longer. Higher benefits per retiree. Benefits have been increased dramatically over 30 times since the beginning of Social Security. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying it's right. Everybody made a valid political argument, but the benefits have grown tremendously. And then, as was pointed out, benefits grow with wages right now rather than with prices. Wages have been growing about 1% per year faster than prices. Doesn't sound like much. It adds up to a lot over the long haul. Tax revenue is not going to keep up. We've, we've heard about lower labor force growth, lower fertility. Productivity growth. People keep saying, well, we could just have higher productivity growth. That would make that wage base rise. Tax revenue would come flowing in. We would save the day. But the problem is, if we knew how to increase productivity growth, that would be the silver, silver bullet. It's just very hard to do. Another proposal is to make more of pay, sorry, yeah. Another, another reason that the revenue isn't growing very quickly is people have figured out clever ways to shield their earnings, their compensation from social security taxes. Every time my employer pays me a dollar in a health care, health insurance premium, that's shielded from social security tax. And people have lots of ways of doing that, and that's been another part of the problem. What are some of the options for Social Security? Well, there's the political answer, I fear, which is just muddle along and hope it goes away. It'll be settled on somebody else's watch. And when the time comes, we'll either have to raise benefits or cut benefits a lot, sorry, sorry to disappoint you, or raise taxes a lot, or probably both. And I have to say there's precedent for that. In um, when 1983, when the Greenspan Commission last was confronted with Social Security shortfalls, they were about three months from running out of benefits money to pay benefits checks. So this was a real tight problem. This was a crisis situation. And they did, in fact, raise taxes and cut benefits both. Maybe we'll be there again. Another possibility is turn the whole thing into a welfare program. Uh, as Ned pointed out, one option is simply to say, if you have income, if you have assets, sorry, you don't get any benefits. Now, he suggested this would be unpopular. I would take a little bit of a different view. It may be necessary from an affordability point of view, and it already is happening in the Medicare prescription drug plan. There is already means tested being implemented within that system. It wouldn't take much to bring it over to Social Security. Now, I, I understand there's somebody in the room that used to work for, with Wilbur Cohen. Is this person still here? I remember Wilbur Cohen used to say, a program for the poor is a poor program. And this was one thing that he viewed as very deleterious about a means-tested system. Um, it would lose political support, quite possibly. And there's also behavioral responses. If you tell people, hey, we're going to take care of you at some level, no matter how much money you have. People might not save. They might blow it all. They might take big risks. That might be problematic. You could also move to funding. 
And we mentioned already the possibility the government could invest the trust fund in the capital market, or instead of having the government control the money, you could have personal retirement accounts, about which I'll say more momentarily. What about the government investing the trust fund? I guess I'm making two arguments. One, it's just not nearly enough. And number two, I don't really believe it's feasible. The social security system has been running a surplus since 83. This is this, this IOU stuff that's been going into the file cabinets in West Virginia. It's on the order of about $1.7 trillion. That money has already been spent. You could take the annual continual surpluses going forward, but as was already, the point was already made, the money's been spent anyway by the federal government in other regards. So then you would simply bring home the need to try to raise revenue some other way. And I believe political interference would be a huge concern. Japan for many, many years has had the government investing its surpluses. They have roads going to nowhere. They have airports sinking into the sea. This is all done with publicly chosen investment projects. I think it's a very big problem. Ultimately, could the trust fund really be lockboxed? I don't believe it can. One of my colleagues, Kent Smetters, has estimated that every dollar put into this trust fund has led to $2.76 more in government debt. So I don't believe it's a viable way to go. Just a couple words on the commission to strengthen social security. This is the group I served on a couple back in 2001. First point to make is that it was a bipartisan, that is half Democrats, half Republicans commission, chaired by Daniel Patrick Moynihan and Richard Parsons. We had a challenge. Our charge was to bring Social Security back into solvency. That seems like a no-brainer, but that was our goal. While, and here were the catches, maintaining Social Security benefits for anybody retired or near retirement which we took as age 55 plus. So can't change the benefits for folks getting benefits. All right, fine. Don't raise the payroll tax, says the president, and offer voluntary personal accounts, individually managed. So this is a pretty tight set of restrictions. How did we proceed? If ever some evening you find yourself unable to sleep, our report is on the website, uh, cssss.gov. Let me just give you the Cliff's Notes version. So we had three major parts of our preferred proposal, or the one that's gotten the most public press. First of all, move from wage indexing to price indexing. And what I didn't perceive before I got started was how powerful this change is in many different directions. What you would do is you would not cut benefits compared to today at all. Everybody in the future would have the same purchasing power as they would under today's benefit rules for people retiring today. But the rate of growth of benefits would be lower. And that's basically the single change that brings the system back into solvency. No one would have their benefits cut, notwithstanding a lot of political hype to the contrary. Second, go to price indexing actually is beneficial in the sense that there's some money left over. You do better than achieve solvency. So one thing you could do is quit price, uh, price indexing after a while and do what Ned proposes, go back to wage indexing. Another thing you could do is target the poor. And on the commission, we felt very strongly that we have to fix a def deficiency in this security system, that today there's no minimum benefit. You can work your whole life and be below the poverty line. We said we should fix that. We should use some of the money that we would achieve under the price indexing, not only to bring the low wage earner to poverty line, but to 120%. And we would also give more to surviving spouses. And then last but surely not least, the personal retirement account story. What we proposed was a carve out where you could take four percentage points out of your payroll tax if you wanted. You would not have to do it. You could remain in the traditional Social Security if you wished. If you opt to carve out some of those contributions and invest them, you can't get the whole benefit you would have been promised under the old system. And there would have to be an offset. The way we structured the offset was if you thought you could earn 2% real in your private account, then you would be neutral vis-a-vis -vis staying in or going out. If you thought you could do better than 2% real, you'd make money 
going into the personal account. What impact did this have? Well, the most important impact was that it restored the system to solvency. The cost line, benefit line would cross, and you would not only have that happen, but you'd have enough money, as I said, to try to enhance benefits at the bottom. What was the public reaction? Next slide. So this is a, I don't know if you could read it in the back row, Social Security. Tsunami Warning Center. There's been a 9.0 demographic quake. A wa tidal wave of retirees is headed this way. And then the Bush character says, activate the emergency plan. And the donkey says, risk, uh, what, and risk frightening the public? So there was a huge amount of denial and a hu huge amount of controversy resulting from that. Key points, just to summarize them, our proposal, and then the president basically took up our proposal, modified it slightly, moved ahead. No privatization. We did not propose shutting down Social Security. No benefit cuts. There would be a stronger safety net. By the way, a point mentioned by Bob Willis, the personal retirement account would be bequeathable in the event of death and divisible in the event of divorce. Right now, for all of you young folks that maybe haven't been married or are thinking about it, you've got to stay married 10 years or you get no benefit after getting divorced from your spouse's social security. This would offer a benefit in a much more transitory society. Diversification, it would let people choose, have some choice over investments, and we thought greater transparency. So in my time remaining, how many minutes? Okay, in my time remaining, next slide. Let me just uh, raise this other gorilla that's looking around the corner. The numbers may vary between our different presentations, but the point is the same. The social security problem is about one-seventh of the overall issue. It's Medicare that really has us bankrupt. So Medicare, parts A, B, and D, are going to cost us on the order of 60-some trillion. This is a huge unfunded liability. We've got to fix social security now, or there won't be any money by the time we deal with Medicare. So who's going to bear the cost of the Medicare reform? This is the pharmacist saying, here's your prescription, ma'am. Your grandson can pay for it at the front desk. That's exactly what we're doing by raising benefit promises today with no means to finance them being made explicit. So conclusion. Our current system is, I think, horribly risky. For any of you already retired, my sense is the politics are going to protect you on Social Security. Do not go to sleep resting easy about Medicare, because heaven only knows how that benefit's going to be paid. We've got to get going reforming Social Security soon. And the most important thing is to get the math rate, to have people understand what the consequences are of not doing it right. I believe that funding and offering personal accounts is a viable piece of a bigger reform. Now, having said that and having spent the last four years talking to people, in fact, I even traveled with the president to um, talk about personal accounts, where do I think things stand now? Well, let me just refresh your memory. Remember the lady, I don't remember exactly her name, but she was out in California and she went to eat at a fast food restaurant and claimed to have discovered a human finger in her chili. Remember that? And it was a whole liability issue and a fraud and a hoax, though it really was a finger. Okay, so let's look at the last slide. This is uh, the prospects for personal accounts. There's a bowl of Social Security reform chili and then a little finger in it, and it's, called, it's labeled personal accounts. And the elephant says, Psst, maybe they'd like it better without the finger. So on that, I'll leave you and turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you. Third speaker is Henry Aaron. I'm going to place some uh, rather unusual demands on you. Uh, I'm going to ask you just to listen. I have no PowerPoint slides at all. Um, I also uh, have to tell you that I think there are very deep truths embedded in alphabetical ordering. Uh, and I think that uh, today, um, Becky has decided to teach me how it is to be Bob Willis all your life. Uh, if, uh, if this uh, afternoon was a banquet, uh, the order of the courses would be rather odd. We would have started with the main course, 
Uh, we would have moved on to uh, what I will characterize as three side dishes. Uh, I, I like to regard myself as the dessert uh, to this uh, repast. Uh, I'm going to try and do four things uh, in my comments. Um, first, I'm going to present the fiscal problems that Ned and uh, the others have focused on, but in a slightly different way uh, from the way they have done. Uh, the second thing I'm going to do is uh, reemphasize the point that's been made that Healthcare costs are really the big enchilada here. Uh, and I emphasize healthcare costs, not Medicare. I'll come back to that. Third, uh, I'm going to support the view that Social Security, uh, well, I, is not uh, as large a problem as uh, Medicare is, but I'm going to go further and argue that it really isn't a very big problem at all, and that in practice it shouldn't cause us to break a sweat uh, because there are viable compromises uh, that could be reached within the political center. And finally, I'm going to do something that Ned is much too nice to do and Olivia would be disinclined to do. Uh, I am going to uh, suggest some of the political reasons uh, why action on Social Security seems as remote uh, as it does, I think, to all of us uh, as it is. Uh, I'm going to suggest that what, has, what we're really seeing here are the after effects of brass knuckle politics associated with the Medicare Modernization Act enacted in 2003, uh, an event that, in my view, for this administration irrevocably destroyed prospects of cooperation between Democrats and Republicans. After yesterday's news, I'm tempted to call this the delayed effect. Ooh. So let me start with the fiscal challenge. Uh, chicken little rhetoric uh, from the administration and others notwithstanding, the actual challenge from Social Security's deficit is really rather modest. Between now and uh, 2040, uh, that's a date after the last baby boomer has retired. The cost of Social Security, uh, measured as a share of gross domestic product, uh, is projected to rise by 2.1 percentage points. That's a 35-year period. Uh, there is no projected increase in the cost of Social Security as a share of GDP thereafter. And those of you who are arithmetically on your toes will wonder how what I just said could be true and the charts that were previously shown could be true. To keep your attention alive, I will answer it during question period. <laughs> um, that means that the increase in the cost of Social Security between now and 2040 is about six-tenths of one percent of GDP per decade. For reference, the cost of Social Security actually rose 2.1% of GDP in just 14 years between 1969 and 1983. The expenditures on national defense rose by 1.6% of GDP in just seven years from 1979 to 1986. These two comparisons it tell me at least that the projected total increase in Social Security costs is not particularly large by historical standards and that it comes on relatively slowly. Uh, now, I want you to note that I have cited Social Security spending as a share of GDP and not, as uh, the previous speakers have done, the projected trust fund deficit. In the United States, we happen to pay for Social Security with an earmarked tax and we channel it through a trust fund. Not all countries do so. We could finance it in other ways here. Now, my own view is that earmarking and using the trust fund is good policy. I think it contributes to fiscal discipline with respect to a program that Congress might be tempted to expand irresponsibly. The fact is that politicians gain immediately from promising to raise pensions 
but the costs don't come in for years, even decades. And that combination uh, is a sore temptation to demagoguery and irresponsible legislation. Earmarking and long-term accounting reduce that risk. They have contributed to the fact that the U.S. Social Security system is among the most parsimonious pension systems in the developed industrial world. Linking benefits to the same base on which taxes are levied also gives beneficiaries the sense that they've paid for their pensions and are not the objects of charity. That sense persists, although in fact, uh, benefit, the connection between benefits and taxes is really pretty loose. Still, I think it's a good thing, and the reason I think it's a good thing is that people regard Social Security as a pension, not as welfare. They can go in and they cash their checks with pride and not with shame. But my objective now is not primarily to uh, praise earmarked financing. Rather, it's that I want to emphasize that the fiscal burden is best measured by how much the program will cost not by whether earmarked revenues exceed or fall short of projected outlays. The fiscal burden would be the same however the benefits were financed. Now, if one focuses on cost and not on deficits, then Social Security is just one among the full menu of government obligations, including national defense, interest on the debt, health care spending, and everything else that government does. Ned uh, and everybody else have focused on one of those other obligations, Medicare. Like Social Security, Medicare mostly serves the elderly and the disabled. And for that reason, Medicare is subject to the same demographic and economic forces that drive Social Security outlays. But per capita Social Security benefits, roughly speaking, rise at the same rate as wages under current law. Per capita Medicare outlays, in contrast, rise approximately with national average health care spending. And those numbers have outpaced per capita earnings growth by about two and a half percentage points a year for the last four decades. The principal driver behind these uh, rising health care spending uh, totals uh, is advancing medical technology. It's not primarily aging, and projections into the future do not suggest that aging is a major part of projected increases uh, in total health care spending. Uh, most of the increase in health care spending that comes from technology goes for stuff that's really worth what it costs, that's highly beneficial. Uh, as an aside, Bob Topel and Kevin Murphy at the University of Chicago estimate that the increase in longevity between 1970 and about 2000, much of which, but not all of which, is due to uh, health care, uh, uh, improved health care, is worth about as much in terms of increased utility as all economic growth, measured economic growth combined. But as health care spending has been rising, a growing absolute amount, although perhaps a declining proportion, goes for health care that yields few benefits or none at all. Now, looking ahead to the future, there really isn't any sign that the gap between growth of per capita health care spending and per capita earnings is going to narrow. And that means that Medicare outlays as a share of GDP are going to go up uh, by a number that is the product of the increase in the proportion of the population that claims benefits multiplied by the excess of the growth of per capita health care spending over the growth of wages. Now, the math that comes out of that is striking. If they historical two and a half percentage point gap persists, Medicare and Medicaid taken together are going to rise from 4.2% of GDP 
to about 16.1% of GDP by 2040. That nearly 12 percentage point increase is almost six times the roughly two percentage point increase in the share of GDP projected to go to Social Security. It's more than one and a half times as large as total current personal income tax collections, which account for 7.6 percent of GDP. It's nearly twice total current payroll tax collections, which absorb 6.3 percent of GDP. What that means is that if Medicare and Medicaid were not changed and historical growth trends continued, it would be necessary to nearly double both income and payroll taxes as a share of GDP by 2040 to pay for their added costs. Now, in my view, that is a big deal, a really big deal. And they understate matters because they exclude state spending on Medicaid, which covers about 40 percent of the cost of the Medicaid program, and they also exclude the increasing share of worker compensation that will go for private health care for the non-disabled working age population. If current trends continue, growth of GDP and of health care, half of all economic growth will go to increased health care spending by 2021, and all of economic growth would go to it by the year 2051. So while I share the view that dealing with the added costs of, um, of Social Security is serious, I do not think it is a major problem, but I am extremely troubled by the challenge from health care spending. I want to stress that the problem is not just a Medicare problem. It is, or, and not, pri not even just a Medicare and Medicaid problem. It is most assuredly not an entitlement problem. The challenge comes from the fact that per capita health care spending is likely, in total, is likely to rise a lot faster than income uh, and that a large part of our income is, will have to be devoted to it unless major changes are made in the structure of health care financing in general. Unless we limit the overall growth of total health care spending, and that means not just Medicare, not just Medicaid, but all of it, some very bad things, I believe, are going to happen. First, we may find ourselves forced to undermine some very fundamental promises to the poor, the elderly, and the disabled. Some very vulnerable people may find themselves treated as second-class consumers of health care. And second, we will continue to spend a lot of money uh, on health care that it really isn't worth what it costs. Now, I'm going to go back to Social Security uh, for my last few comments. When President Bush took office in 2001, uh, he had a wonderful chance, in my view, to implement his vision of Social Security change. It was not my vision, but uh, let's face it, he was elected president, not me. Uh, he had a wonderful chance because he inherited projections of very large budget surpluses. The surpluses were there because the nation was fiscally conservative during the 1990s, because the nation was very prosperous and very lucky during that same decade, and because President Clinton had resisted cutting taxes setting as his motto, save Social Security first. I'm sure many of you remember that. S President Bush could have used those surpluses to pay for the so-called transition costs associated with implementing the individual accounts he had advocated during his campaign. He didn't. President Bush's program was cut taxes first, and second, and third. He got his way. Then came recession and 9-11. Projections of surpluses gave way to projections of endless deficits. The opportunity to create individual accounts while at the same time 
restoring fiscal balance to Social Security was lost. Creating private accounts with funds diverted from Social Security, as President Bush proposed, would have deepened budget deficits and increased Social Security's projected long-term deficit. Even with cuts in traditional benefits that Olivia described and that the President eventually endorsed, both the projected Social Security deficit and the overall budget deficit would have been increased for decades. In brief, the Bush program consisted of a direct cut in Social Security benefits and authorization to workers to divert payroll taxes from Social Security if they accepted still further cuts in traditional benefits, which might or might not offset, be offset by benefits that they could eventually receive from the individual accounts. Believe it or not, this plan failed to kindle much enthusiasm, <laughs> even among Republicans. Democrats took one look and broke out the champagne. They didn't even trouble to put forward a plan of their own. The pol political motivation was to let the public's undistracted attention rest on the president's plan. Now, Democrats did take a bit of flack from good government wonks like many of us here, who soberly advised them that it was the duty of the loyal opposition to come up with better ideas in order to prove that they should be returned to power. Somehow, Democratic office holders decided that they cared more about winning than proving to good government types that they deserved power. So they stood back and they let a bad plan founder, which it has done spectacularly. They stood back for another reason. Democrats recalled the results of trying to be the responsible opposition in 2003 over the Medicare Modernization Act. At that time, Senate Democrats worked with their Republican colleagues to pass a bill that both sides could accept. It differed in essential ways from the one that had previously passed the House of Representatives and that Senate Democrats could not abide. Uh, the Senate Democrats anticipated that, as is customary, differences would be ironed out in the conference committee. They assumed that, as is customary, they and the Republicans would split the difference. The features that were most objectionable to both sides would be jettisoned. That didn't happen. House and Senate Republicans froze Democrats out of the conference completely. Republicans met behind closed doors and wrote the final bill without any of the usual compromises. The Medicare actuary was strong-armed into suppressing estimates that showed that the bill would cost far more than the budget resolution authorized, which was very important because items in the budget resolution could pass with a simple majority, but extra outlays would have been subject to a filibuster and would have required a 60% majority to pass. To cap it all, the House leadership flouted procedures by extending the usual 15-minute voting period to three hours, giving time to break a few arms and convert what seemed to be a sure loss into a narrow victory. The Democrats drew the obvious conclusion from this episode that they could not trust Republicans to play fair. They decided that if the Republicans had the votes, they could pass their damn Social Security bill, but that they were going to have to do it without Republican support, uh, Democratic support or Democratic cover. As it happened, the Republicans didn't have the votes because some of them defected and others were afraid to act without cover of democratic participation. Now, I want to join all of the others in expressing acute regret that this is the way things turned out. Uh, it is regrettable because early action to put Social Security on sound long-term financial footing is very desirable. But through excessive tax cuts, an ill-conceived and dishonestly justified and botched war, back-alley politics on Medicare, 
and breathtaking ineptness in responding to Hurricane Katrina, the Bush administration, in my view, has effectively terminated its own capacity to engineer major change in domestic affairs. I'm afraid that we're going to have to wait for the next president, at least, before action is taken uh, to deal with Social Security. I think that is a very, very bad shame, as the sooner we move to uh, deal with this problem, the better, precisely for the reasons that uh, others have emphasized and that I would like to reinforce. We need to get that problem out of the way, because then we have a really big problem to face, and that is the reform of health care financing, a part of which is Medicare, but not all of which. And that is going to be a major challenge, not just to our political system, but to our analytical skills as well. Thank you. Before we move to the question and answer session, I'd like to um, give the panelists maybe uh, a few minutes to, if they'd like to respond to comments that other panelists have made. Um, uh, Bob, would you like to start? Um, actually, I, I think I'd be happy to hear, hear discussion, okay. so I'm... Yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to yep. get response. Well, great. Uh, so we have a, a microphone in the middle of the room. Uh, if you have a question, please go up to the microphone. Uh, it'd be great if you could introduce yourself and ask a succinct question. I think we've left them dumbfounded, <laughs> <laughs> speechless. Please. <laughs> Uh, Vice President Cheney came to Battle Creek a few months ago as part of the, the uh, roadshow on the Bush plan, and uh, he said two interesting things uh, to the audience. He said, do you people uh, 55 and older don't worry about a thing. Social Security will be there. The taxes are there to pay your benefits. And then he said to the younger people, we have a great deal for you. We're going to let you take the tax, some of the taxes that you're now paying to pay the benefits of older people and use them yourself in your private account. And uh, it struck me, as I think it would have struck uh, Henry Aaron at least and, and others as well, that the biggest problem with that is you can't spend the same dollar twice. And the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities estimates that the Bush plan, as sketched out, would in, entail deficits over the next 25 years, which would total $4.6 trillion, which uh, strikes me as being real money. And uh, I just wonder how we can contemplate going into that kind of a situation, or uh, at, le at least we did contemplate it earlier in the year. here uh, would agree that uh, continuing to pile up large amounts of public debt uh, is adverse to the long-run interests of the nation. Um, we uh, have emphasized different parts of the budget uh, in, our, in our talks, uh, but I think uh, as sort of all, almost all economists um, will not sign on to the deficits don't matter uh, uh, manifesto. Maybe I'm misspeaking for others, but I think not. Uh, and for the simple reason that deficits subtract from national saving and thereby deprive those who come after us of, uh, of capital that could be used to enhance productivity. Now, we may disagree about whether a particular policy on net 
will have the effect of reducing national saving. Uh, I think uh, there's certainly disagreement uh, as to the net effect of private accounts, uh, I think, in the table. Uh, but uh, as to the unwisdom of uh, large long-term deficits, uh, is there a dissent? I guess I would have the following observation. Um, as everyone's pointed out, the current system is one which has already a legacy cost. That is, the current system has promised benefits and it doesn't have the tax revenue to pay them under the rules. That's a fact. The current system has what we call an implicit debt of $11 trillion. That's a fact. I mean, whether it's 11.1 or, you know, the issue is it's a huge unfunded liability. It is not counted as part of our explicit government debt, but that doesn't make it any less important. So when you claim that, or when critics claim that you can't spend the same dollar twice, you can't pay the retirees and pay yourself, that's absolutely right. But that doesn't solve the problem that we have a huge gap. And the fact is that anybody who wants to reform the system in any direction is going to have to figure out how to chip away at that unfunded liability and figure out how to make the system better going forward. Now, this boils down to the question of what is the correct counterfactual. Let's take as an assumption that we have an $11 trillion unfunded liability out there. The Commission's plan, which the President took and modified slightly, moved you from an $11 trillion unfunded liability to a solvent system. It got rid of that implicit debt. Yes, it costs money. It cost about half a percent of GDP when the financing is needed to get you to that eventual result. In present value, it costs you less than $1 trillion in GDP. And then you erase the unfunded liability. So I think it's an unfair claim to say, oh, there's huge transition costs associated with the reform. We've already got the costs. And the fact is, we have to recognize them in moving toward a solution. A lot of uh, discussion of Social Security, uh, how big it is. Olivia keeps talking about the uh, open group liability of $11 trillion. Hank keeps talking about the share of GDP, 1%. These are the same numbers. Well, it's, I mean, the, uh, in, in the trustees' report, it's a, it's a one, uh, the, the Social Security liability is 1% of GDP over the indefinite future. The same numbers. Uh, is, is that big or not big? Uh, you know, it's, uh, it, as uh, Hank said, it's manageable. We could do this. Uh, my retirement age suggestion alone would, would do that. Um, and uh, so then the question is, uh, we, we see this small problem near this huge problem, and uh, should we think about these other things like changing the tax system or, uh, you know, some of the other things that I mentioned and others mentioned? Um, I would say yes. I would say that we, we got to worry about the small problem and, uh, and, and at least uh, uh, anticipate the big problem coming along. Um, and, uh, but, uh, you, know, you know, that's uh, partly uh, an issue in the eye of the beholder. The one thing I would say, I, I was not a fan of the, uh, the, the Bush carve-out approach. Actually, I liked option three of, of Olivia's uh, commission report a little better than, than that. That wasn't, wasn't far from the plan that I recommended uh, when I had my bite at the apple. But I think the, uh, a, a lot of us feel that, uh, and this is a different way to, uh, it, it's maybe a perhaps more measured way to say what the uh, person on my left said, uh, that uh, the individual accounts weren't chipping, chipping away uh, in, in the way that Olivia was mentioning. They, uh, they, they were basically system neutral. And uh, a lot of us uh, did want to chip away, uh, whether on the tax side, retirement age, benefit cuts, whatever. But individual accounts didn't do that. And I think, uh, in a sense, that was the lost opportunity of this year. 
Did you want to respond? Yeah, I, I just wanted to make uh, <clears throat> one other point. Just uh, in terms of thinking about, in, in, you know, at sort of the real level, at, at sort of the fundamental level, if we engage in pay-as-you-go financing, we get sort of, as has been explained, the, a, a return that's essentially the rate of growth, the rate of population growth plus the rate of productivity growth. If we uh, invest in extra capital, we get the marginal return from capital. In, um, in, in uh, our society and most, the, the rate of return on capital is marginal return on capital, and I'd, by that I really mean physical capital and human capital, education and training as well as, as, well as <clears throat> you, you get that return. Now, you can only get that extra capital if, the, if, you're going to, if you're going to invest more. Simply swapping bonds around, whether it's deficits in the general account or it's or it's in social security is immaterial so I think that that needs to be that needs to be made clear a second point that I'd like to make is that the uh, return the, the growth rate return which is looking very dismal in countries like Germany or Italy and uh, somewhat better in countries like the United States if we look at it from a worldwide point of view is is uh, is not so bad these countries like China, or Korea that I showed and others are having very rapid declines in, in, in uh, population growth, but uh, before they get to a very large old population, they have a very large young population which is also increasingly well educated going through and producing and, and, and if they did nothing, those people would have to save a great deal. What is, would really then be involved is that we, as you know, we we in uh, old Europe and uh, maybe old, the old Americas could join, <laughs> would would benefit from the from the savings and and the productivity of the capital financed that way from from these other people. Now it would rec it would result in a shift in the ownership of the capital stock, <laughs> and and uh, that would that would go to the to the uh, th those people who engaged in the saving and i'm not sh and i suspect that politically that would be a, a ultimately be a volatile volatile issue but i think we do need to think worldwide as well as as well as just in the us i, I have a question i think um, that tries to go across the three of you and um, I, I'm curious, three, the, three the, three, the three Social Security comes uh, from the big panelists. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, um, it strikes me, Olivia, that the, and I may be wrong, so somebody can correct me, that the difference between the Greenspan Commission and your commission reflects something Henry said about the decline of policy analysis because your commission answered given a very tight mandate. You, you're supposed to do this, but you can't raise taxes. And I was drawn to Ned's last slide that said, here are a number of things we could do to cut it in half. And so it's, and, and Henry talked about modest tax increases. And so I sort of have a feeling if we put the three of you together, since you all agree on the numbers, as analysts working without political constraint, there probably is not that much difference between what you would come up with. What it would be might be eight or ten little things done at various times that would involve some cut in benefit level, some rise in taxes, some change in the retirement age, et cetera, among the things you said. So the question really is, is this, this goes back to Henry, um, is there more agreement here among analysts than one can get in the political arena? I, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll answer. I think uh, the three of us or the four of us, uh, if, if you uh, put us in a room, we could uh, figure out Social Security in uh, maybe 10 minutes. I mean, I think we could, we could easily come up with something. Uh, the, there are two problems with that. One is uh, we don't have to get elected, and uh, others do, and uh, that that part is harder. Uh, there, uh, the uh, the the menu that we would come up with would be uh, largely pain, maybe all pain, and uh, that. Uh, so I, I think, in some sense, the problem is more political than it is. 
the fact that the analysts can't figure this out. The analysts, I think, can figure it out and can agree. The second thing is that you could uh, put put us, and we could we could take the uh, we could we could give you uh, an exam and take the uh, highest 10 percent of the audience in a room. We could not do the same thing for the health programs, uh, uh, partly Medicare and partly all of health. I mean, Hen Hank is right about that. It's Medicare is just the uh, tip of the iceberg on the health problem. We could not do it for that. Let, let me just uh, respond quickly. It's true that our commission had a rather tight mandate, and I think I probably became more aware of the constraints the more we were trying to work with the numbers and actually doing the Social Security actuarial calculations and so forth. But I guess I bought into it for a couple of reasons, notwithstanding the fact that I'm a Democrat. First of all, I believe that Medicare is and will be a far more painful problem to solve. So I wanted to try to come up with a fix within the current Social Security payroll tax regime. That's point number one. And so I wanted to see how far we could go. As I believe Ned accurately said, the personal accounts were a wash. They don't make it better. They don't make it worse. It's the price indexing that's, that brings you back to solvency. Number two, I don't believe, and this is a question now of philosophical public policy position, I don't believe that the government ever has saved the trust fund. I believe the evidence is fairly compelling that if you give the money, the government surplus, to the Treasury, they spend it. In fact, they more than spend it. And so that's why I was led to the, down the path of favoring personal accounts. And so at the end of the day, you really are faced with that question. You could raise the retirement age. You could raise the payroll tax. You could uncap Social Security. But all that's going to do is increase the surplus, which will then give to Treasury, which Treasury will spend. And we're going to be right back in the same sauce that we're in right now. Uh, Senator Moynihan once said everybody's entitled to his opinion, but not everybody is entitled to their facts. Uh, Olivia is wrong when she says personal accounts are a wash under the accounting methods used by the Social Security Administration. Under the methods used by the Social Security Administration, the President's personal account proposal increased the projected 75-year deficit. Not 75 years. That's well, that's, many, that's, that's what's used uh, in the political world. That's what I'm doing that's right. Uh, you can't, one can't uh, assume away the metric that is used as a standard matter uh, in uh, analytical discussions. It, incre it increases the size of the projected deficit by about one-third. Now, as for uh, uh, sitting us down in a room, uh, appoint us three as a base closer, closure commission. Uh, and I think the answer to your question, Sheldon, is yes, if. And the if is if uh, we can do it without uh, a carve-out personal accounts. If uh, that's part of the discussion, then the answer is no, we couldn't uh, reach agreement. But uh, to be quite specific, uh, we would, uh, I think, agree on some increase in the so-called full benefits age, which is sometimes misnamed the normal retirement age, which isn't normal at all because, as Bob pointed out, the normal retirement age is age 62. Uh, we would uh, include state and local government employees, uh, which helps on the 75-year numbers more than it does on the infinite horizon numbers, but it does help over the 75 years. We would probably adjust the price index uh, to take account of certain biases in the CPI currently used. Uh, we would ra slightly raise the wage base, and uh, I would suggest, although I might lose my two colleagues on this, slightly raising the uh, payroll tax rate. If you took a little bit of each of those, uh, you could put together a proposal that uh, would easily deal with uh, financing problems over the next 75 years. And I'd like to speak to the issue of whether it makes sense to use Infinite Horizon, hereby taking on both my friends on, uh, on each side. Uh, the idea that one would wait in current decisions present value of surpluses or deficits between, to pull two years at random, the years 3,000 and 7,500 on the same basis as one would uh, factor in the present value of numbers over the next 15 not, or 20 years. Just incorrect. Yeah. That is not incorrect. <laughs> uh, it is present value. <laughs> 
Could I, could I speak on behalf of infinity? Uh, it, you haven't heard the case opposed yet. Uh, well, uh, I, I know it's coming. Um, they don't. They don't. Well, you want to give the case? Uh, let me hear the case against and then the, make it the, easier to give uh, the case for. The, the, it's uh, not that we uh, think that we can predict uh, things uh, well in year 76 plus. But I think there is a big political problem in using a uh, 75-year uh, standard and sticking to it. When you've got a situation where we know perfectly well that the 75th year is a year of very large deficit, because that means we have a political convention, we come, we solve the problem, and one year later, we haven't solved the problem. And I think that's a big political problem. And I think that uh, we would be better off, uh, mathematically, it is a simple matter to work out something. Uh, the way we actually do this is not by projecting things in yet year 76 and on. It is just by stabilizing the trust fund ratio in the last year. And mathematically, that is really tantamount to just using the information in the first 75 years and avoids the political embarrassment uh, that happened even to the Greenspan Commission of uh, waiting a few years and having their their supposed fix not be a fix anymore. So that's the, that's the argument for infinity. Uh, that isn't the argument for infinity. It's an argument for using 75 years and a stable trust fund at the end of the period. Those are not well, equivalent. Is, yeah. They are not equivalent well, then, then because then, uh, the okay. effect of compound interest dis, uh, divergences stretch out into infinity, but they are short-circuited by using that. So uh, I perhaps you should have let me finish the. Uh... Okay. Let me just make one quick response to this. <laughs> a long time ago, Social Security. In fact, I've talked to other countries' finance ministers where they use a projection window of two years to decide if social, their social security system is solvent. You know, some small countries in the Caribbean, I say, well, wait a minute, you know, there's some folks going to be there the third year and the fourth year and the fifth year, so aren't you going to factor them in? And that's just not their philosophy, and it's a tough sell. In the U.S., we've had 10 years over the period of time the trustees have been encouraged to go to a 75-year window, and that sort of seems appealing because the sense is most folks who are going to be around in 75 years are probably born today, and we can set up something that works for them. The issue is when you have a long-term pension system, as was correctly pointed out, you don't want to fix it for today, have the window move forward a year, and go back down the tubes again, point number one. Point number two, if any arbitrary cutoff is biased against certain kinds of policy reforms, in particular, reforms that move to funding. Why? Because moving to a funded system requires an investment now, a cost, and reaps a payback later, a benefit. If you arbitrarily cut off at 10 years or 75 years or what have you, you lose all the benefits going forward. It's a policy decision what cutoff you use. And I believe you should, at a minimum, talk about both numbers, which is what the Social Security actuaries have now done, and in fact is part of ongoing policy. I just want to make a, a quick comment, which is if you take apart the trust funds from the general fund deficit and you go to the end of the Bush administration, uh, don't we have an $11 trillion debt? Which is, and, and we look at it currently for deficit spending and say it's okay. But we have six and a half trillion, a trillion, a trillion seven in the, in the trust fund. We're going out at six or seven hundred billion a year. Um, so I mean, all of a sudden, it, it's okay if we do a general thing. And I'm not suggesting that Social Security isn't important, but I, I think we need to look at where are the most important issues to look at. And the current deficit is a bigger problem than Social Security. Healthcare is a bigger problem, and. I guess that's it. I think the chief argument for dealing with Social Security is the one that uh, was suggested by Sheldon's uh, challenge to us, which is it is a manageable problem. Sometimes by dealing with a problem that isn't the most important but is one on which 
the technical obstacles are not excessive. Uh, if you can deal with it and get it behind you, it helps establish an environment that facilitates dealing with others. Uh, this is in no way to uh, downplay the significance of the overall deficit, uh, which is something on which I believe we can have also current, uh, significant current progress. Uh, I agree entirely with Ned's comment that uh, health, that is a, a very difficult challenge. I think we are at a closing point. I want to thank everyone on our panel, all of our speakers today. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you all for coming. Um, there are um, refreshments out here, and I'm sure we'll give you a few minutes. Yeah. Okay, good.